Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel, beloved. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. How precious His Word. What would we do without it? You know, on a day when you have problems, things maybe don't quite go right, what would we do without His beautiful Word? His Word that gives us the answer to every question, the solution to every problem, the greatest counselor of all counselors, His Word, our Father's Word. We just thank Him for the privilege of being able to gather with you to study that Word, to find what it is our Father would have to say to us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, here it is, uh, just after the close of the book of Ezekiel. We're going to just talk tonight and visit a little bit. We're going to go into a subject that we covered here on a weekend, and then a newsletter was written about it. But I think it's important that we talk about it a little more on television. I want to, don't want you to miss the thoughts in this study. I think it's that important as we're about to come into the Passover season to have these things clear and, and that that is paramount in your mind that should be. So I want you to open your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 61. We're going to take a few verses there and then we're going to the New Testament. We're going to cover that scripture that is known as the gap theory, that scripture that Jesus got up in the synagogue and read to a point in that scripture and in the middle of a verse uh, stopped. Why? We're going to find out. His time is his time. His seasons are his seasons and we should be aware of those seasons. So I'm just going to begin reading in Isaiah chapter 61. We're going to be talking about a bridegroom a wedding, and a bride. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to open and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. He did that while he was in the tomb. He released those captives that were bound. And then this is the verse in which he closed up the scripture. Let's read it. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, period. That's where he stopped. And then he told them, I tell you today this is fulfilled. This prophecy is fulfilled. Then what did he leave unread? For that prophecy shall soon be fulfilled also. I want you familiar with it. Let's continue on. This is the next word. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. I want you to note that it is God's vengeance that shall comfort those that mourn. What does that mean? Christ could not read the rest of that sentence for the simple reason it was not time, but it soon shall be time. The only ones that will be mourning on the day of God's vengeance is those that realize who Antichrist is and they're mourning for their brethren that are wallowing before him. The day of vengeance shall make us happy. The day of vengeance as some Christians dread that day, God's wrath. You don't have to be afraid of God's wrath, beloved. God's wrath is addressed and will is only to His enemies. Don't you think your Father is able to control that that He will, that is to say even His vengeance? We're going to be comforted by His wrath. For we know that that time has come. So, when Christ walked this earth, he was looking forward also to the fulfillment of the second part of that. Let's go on, verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, 
They had the ashes first, now we're going to give them beauty. They had the bad first, now we're going to give them the good last. And the first shall be last and the last shall be first. You understand? Stay with me. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Do you know what that garment of praise is? It's the wedding garment. He'll be returning as a bridegroom. Will you have that wedding garment up on yourself? And what is it made of? What does it consist of? We'll find out in this chapter. That they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. God planted his elect in the last generation to make that stand against Antichrist. And he shall finish that verse, I am sure, when he returns. Won't it be wonderful to be one of those that hear it in joy rather than sadness? Won't it be wonderful to hear it and rejoice rather than be one of those that will be praying for the mountains to fall upon them, knowing they have been deceived? Now skip with me, if you would, to verse 10. Let's understand this garment. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Not the false God, my God. For he, shall, for he hath clothed me. Do you understand? He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. What is that cloth made of? He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As it is well explained in the Greek in the book of Revelation, your righteous robe is made, your robe rather, that white garment is made of your righteous acts. Do you understand? So naturally it is a robe of righteousness, for it is a robe made up of your righteous acts, and having on the gospel armor in this generation, with the shield of faith in front of you, and standing against the fiery darts of Satan. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. So here comes the bridegroom at the twelfth hour, and his bride... Those that have remained true and loyal shall have on righteous acts. Well, you might say, well, I've been a Christian all my life. I sure don't have to worry. My righteous acts will sustain me. What if in the last moment you worship Antichrist, friend? God said, all your righteous acts, if you bow or sin, will be forgotten. And I'll rather consider your sin. And he was speaking of that generation. Verse 11, For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness, that's what your robe is made out of, and praise to spring forth before all the nations. God's elect, those, one, those righteous people, shall become, if you would, the entire nation of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Because many, many shall be joined to them by the teaching that shall be done in the millennium. Now, speaking of weddings, one of Christ, the first miracle rather, that Christ performed was at a wedding. There's a great deal of meat in it for you that have ears to hear. Turn with me to St. John chapter 2. St. John chapter 2 in the New Testament. Let's go to that Wedding in Cana. And let's understand the true meaning of Christ's first miracle, that is to say, turning water into wine. I want you to remember the gap theory that we just covered in Isaiah chapter 61. That that he read and said, I tell you this day, this prophecy has come to pass, it has fulfilled. And I want you to remember that gap theory so that you can understand. This that is given in John chapter 2. Let us begin verse 1. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. That's to say Cana being the place of the reeds and Galilee the circuit. And the mother of Jesus was there. Mary was at this wedding too. 
and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. They were not a part of the marriage ceremony. They were, if you would, extras there to observe the wedding. Now watch closely what happens. Verse 3, And when they wanted wine, this is the equivalent of the Hebrew yayan, which is to say fermented wine. It can be nothing else. It is not grape juice. And don't ever let some would-be Bible scholar tell you otherwise. It won't hold water. And I'm not making a pun. It is wine. When they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, that is to Jesus, they have no wine. Why? Why would Mary at this wedding tell Jesus they're out of wine? Because through his childhood, he, she knew that when something was wrong, she could depend upon him. He had a way of accomplishing things as a boy growing up. His mother knew he could take care of the situation or she would not have mentioned it to him. And Christ uses this opportunity probably to teach one of the greatest lessons to Christians, especially in this final generation that is overlooked by many. But I want you to see it. And that's why we come to you in this special lecture on this subject so that you can have eyes to see and ears to hear to know and to understand why Jesus' first miracle was to turn water into wine. The mystery lies within the next verse. Verse 4, Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Now, the, the English is a little harsh here. He said, Madam, what have I to do with thee? What, this wedding is nothing to me. My hour has not come, meaning my wedding is not yet. It is not my time. He had read that one verse. He closed the book. It was not time for his wedding. This was someone else's wedding. But he teaches us a lesson concerning his wedding, a wedding that shall be, that should be known and taught throughout Christianity and not watered down by some of these milk to toast Christians that can't talk about wine to understand the clarity of it. They have to be ashamed of it. Don't let that rob you from knowing this mother knew that this one could perform, that he would have an, an, an answer. I'm sure she didn't expect the answer or the deed, rather, that was performed. But to you today, it is a beautiful thing. Five, his mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. She knew he was going to do something about it. She knew that he had the answer, that he would tell them how to solve the problem. She should know she was his mother, and she had been with him these many years knowing his performance. He got the job done. But he says to you, whereby you know and understand without, uh, with certainty, his hour is not yet. This was nothing to him because it was not his wedding. He's going to teach you now something concerning his wedding. Listen closely, verse 6. And there were set... There, six water pots of stone, like earthen vessels, if you would. Six being the sixth dispensation. After the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. This was about 20, uh, say 20 gallons, 20 gallons apiece. It, six. 20-gallon containers. Some people translate it as more. Verse 7. And Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. They filled them up with pure water. Following Christ's advice. 
Those that wear that righteous garment shall be filled to the brim also with his righteous water, the cleansing water, the water that cleanses, that forgives, that teaches truth. Eight. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. They obeyed him to the letter. Obeyance by the servants. Are you going to be a servant? I want you to picture yourself as one of these servants serving this wine. This new wine, if you would. This wine that has been created by a miracle by Jesus Christ. His first public miracle. He said, draw it out and take it to the governor. Why didn't he say take it to the bridegroom? Because he's telling you where the new truth, the new wine must be spent. Verse 9. Listen closely. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water, understand, had tasted the water that was made wine, yayan, and knew not whence it was. In other words, the governor didn't know the least little thing about the miracle. The governor didn't know the least little thing about how the wine came to be. I want you to note the print. But the servants which drew the water knew within parenthesis. Servants know the real truth when they're putting it forth today. But the governors don't. Not the governors of the so-called feast, the spiritual gatherings. They don't know the truth. But the servants, which servants? The servants following Christ's orders know when they serve the best last. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Aha! Here we have the bridegroom. Ten. And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, when they're, the, the word is metho, intoxicated, is when the, he serves his best first, and then when they're intoxicated. Now let someone switch that to grape juice, friend, and see where it gets you. I, I just detest people that change God's word or milk it down to where people lose the truth of it. Because um, uh, they're, they're so afraid they're going to sin a little bit that they can't even trust themselves to say the word wine. It's really shocking, isn't it? They serve the best before the people are so drunk they don't know the difference. That's what he's saying. Then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles, this was Christ's first miracle did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed upon him. It was his first miracle whereby his disciples would believe upon him. Christ still has disciples in, in this world today. This miracle was performed whereby you could believe on him. He gave you first the law. He gave you the worst wine first if you would. Not bad, for it is not written in this story that the wine that was first served was bad wine. It's just that that, that, six, that uh, followed it was so much better that it was obvious even after they were partly intoxicated, they knew it was better. Christ has got the best for you at the last. When you rejoice, when he takes vengeance, uh, upon Antichrist and those that followed him. And as you mourn for your brethren that are deceived, you shall be handed the best last. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Christ's wedding shall be soon. Do you understand the miracle 
the first miracle done, as it was written in that 11th verse, that manifested forth his glory, not in changing a pot of water to wine. That was nothing. It was the real truth that is hidden therein. This was not the time of Christ's wedding, but his wedding shall come, and the best truth that has ever been served shall be served at that time by his election, which are priests through the millennium that will continue serving that better truth, that better wine, that wine that heals. If your stomach, uh, and for your stomach's sake, take a little wine for the good of it, as it is written. But nothing heals as the new wine, beloved. That is to say, to get past the milk of the fluff, taught by the fluffies, and get into the meat of God's Word. I'm not ridiculing them. I'm just saying you need to have a deeper understanding of our Father and His truth and His Word. Jesus had no time for lost motion. He wanted you to understand. At the same time, inasmuch as he gave us the law, and then he gave us salvation, he gave us the Old Testament, he gave us the New Testament. And in another sense, there shall be a wedding before his wedding. The worst wine shall be served there, and it's bad, it's an abomination. And then shall the good wine be served. Do you have ears to hear? And do you have eyes to see? Do you understand the beautiful truth that is written in our Father's Word? That wedding is coming. What garment is it that you wear to participate? You must remember also the parable of he that sent the, good, the men out to call and invite those to that wedding. And as the wedding feast got underway, behold, there was one without a wedding garment on, and he was cast out into hell. Don't ever forget that wedding garment, and then you don't have to worry. It's righteous acts. We have documented that this evening in this lecture. Your righteous acts make up the garment of the bride when she adorns herself for the bridegroom who has adorned himself. For you see... Jesus uh, has indicated in both these places, it is not my time. What is this to me, madam? This is not my wedding. And then he gave us an example of what shall happen at his wedding. How precious the word of God. Beloved, see that you adorn that wedding garment. Well, I want to be real sure, would you be a little more specific about those righteous acts? Righteous acts are not something that many Christians might think is being so saintly that you can't be touched. In being so goody-goody that you're sweet, there's just one problem with that, beloved. You become serpy sweet, and that's sickening. You understand? Now, I'm just telling it, telling it like it is in a language that all of us can understand using simplicity as the Holy Spirit guides us to absorb and to understand the beauty of this spirit message that Jesus so eloquently hid within that miracle for those that would be servants, that would be servants in as much as they would teach to serve that better until he came. And in serving that, manifest your righteous garments. It manifests not only the righteous garments, but it portrays the glory of Jesus Christ. Uh, as he has indicated, I will have the victory and you will participate within it. You will be a part of it. What is necessary? Have on the righteous garment. And some might say, well, where, where did it tell us what that righteous garment was? Isaiah chapter 61 what was it? I think it was verse 10 and 11 there. Told you very clearly, that's what you have to have on. You cannot have on a garment that has already been used at another wedding. Too late, friend. You would be one of those five virgins that were waiting, awaiting another wedding. Boy, they were happy about it. 
they had to be Christians because they expected and anticipated the wedding. They had to be pretty good scholars of God's word because they made it to the 11th hour right up almost to the end, which means they had enough truth. They almost made it, but they were negligent. You know what they forgot to do? They forgot to serve this wine. Now listen, I'm not, I, 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 do, I want you to stay with me. I'm teaching in a spiritual sense, and I don't want you to turn your family into a bunch of wine bibbers out of this now. There's nothing wrong with wine, but don't start serving wine continually. That's not what I'm talking about. I know, I know none of you understand that, but there could be someone listening that doesn't understand. So I want to clarify that. When I say serve the wine as one of these servants, you issue that that Christ has given you to teach, which is pure. It is better than that that was taught before. How often he used this example, the wine and the wine skins. Don't ever try to take this new wine and try to put it into the old church. It'll bust it wide open. You see, the wine skin was exactly that. It wasn't a wine bottle. It wasn't glass. It wasn't crock. It wasn't stone. It was a skin that wine was carried in. An old wine skin, all the stretch was gone out of it. You understand? It was already set in its way. New wine expands. You break it. New truth expands a church to a breaking point. They can't handle new truth. But I tell you this, we live in a generation that they had better prepare themselves mentally to accept the new truth or they're going to learn some of the old, old truths. Or I should say more correctly, they're going to learn some of the old, old untruths because old Slicky's coming along pretty soon with the same bill of goods he handed Eve in the garden. Oh, it won't hurt. Be wise. Meditate. Think on the new age. Think on the things as they are. Be somebody. Be wise in the ways of the world. God is within you. Well, he is. We've been taught that as Christians. But then, you know what they say in the next sentence? And it's old Satan just pulling at their little forked tongue. You see, God is the good in you, and that's all. And boy, there, if you buy that, you're just like Eve. You bought the, you bought the whole thing. If you would buy that, you'd buy the apple story, though it's not in the Bible. You'd buy anything. But he's coming with a wine that's bitter. How oh, it might seem sweet when you look at the container that he'll bring it in. But don't fall into the trap of the humanist in these end times. Don't fall in the trap of the rapture theory that was espoused in 1830. It's dangerous treading in these end times when you flirt with the unknown. That's why you should learn the truth of the new wine and allow that truth to set you free. Free from any possibility of being deceived. For you know beforehand in the truth what shall prevail whereby you can stand in the place where you will be mourning the day that that verse is finished in Isaiah chapter 61. So, don't try then to take this new wine and cram it into the church, the old church, the old bottle. The old skin. If you want to sprinkle it a little bit, sprinkle it if the Holy Spirit leads you. But you'll be rejected there, even as Jesus was rejected there. Take it where he leads you with it. Where it is appreciated. Where God opens eyes and ears to hear the new truth about the new wine and the new marriage. Don't take part in that marriage that is spoken of in Matthew 24. Well, how could that be? 
Jesus said that marriage would take place at the time of his return. For he said in Matthew 24, They shall be giving and taking in marriage exactly as they did in Noah's day. What were they giving and taking in marriage in Noah's day? Fallen angels and Satan. Satan in this instant as Antichrist. It's going to happen again. Are you prepared mentally for that? I hope that our teaching through the Word of God has made that a very common knowledge in your mind. And that in itself proves that you have ears to hear and eyes to see. And that in itself begins to adorn the righteous garment as you hang on to those truths. Hey, he doesn't want some holier than thou yo-yo. He's got enough of those to last a, a lifetime. We are trying to get rid of those holier than thou yo-yos. God doesn't have time for that. He wants people that are willing to stand up and be counted. He wants people that even if the truth hurts a little bit, they teach it and they do it boldly. So don't be frightened in these end times. Do not take part in that marriage. Oh, people have a bad habit of being impatient. It's so difficult for me to have patience. Lord, give me patience now, Lord. Be patient. It's coming and it will be here soon enough. Don't be so impatient that the first marriage that comes along, you join the wedding party. For it will be to Antichrist and the fallen angels that Michael kicks to this earth. I guarantee you there will be no gathering back to Christ before that event takes place. Do not let the traditions of man deceive you. It shall not be. It is not written. Does that mean we should fear? No, beloved. Let your mind think back to the verse Christ taught, stopped, and then continued. He said, I'm going to bring joy and comfort to those that mourn when they see these yo-yos married to Antichrist. So you see, the first wine's not too good. But the wine of our Savior's wedding is the very best. And did he, not, he, did he not say, just before the crucifixion, he reached, he took the cup. And he said, this is my blood that is shed for many. Take it and drink ye all of it. For I tell you this, I shall not drink it again with you until I drink it again with you new, the new wine in the kingdom. He's coming. Wait for the right cup. That's what the holy sacrifice, the holy communion of Passover represents. The new wine. See that you wait for it. Bless your hearts. You listen. I want to share something with you. The book of Revelation, the word that means to reveal, to uncover in any language. What an inspiration to have it done chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That's what this series of tapes does, takes you through the book of Revelation with clarity. And it is amazing when we understand the words that our Father has given us and those things that we can expect, covering subjects such as who are the two churches out of the seven that pleased Christ? All others failed. Who were those two? What does the throne of God actually look like in appearance compared to the throne of Satan? Chapter 6 will give you Satan's throne. Chapter 4 will give you our Father's throne. And that mark of the beast, understand with clarity from the 13th chapter. The book of Revelation, I know you'll enjoy it. Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you 
a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say, in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student, saying, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. Ecclesiastes. This certainly is a book that is a must for every servant of God, and I'll tell you why. It is an acrostic in a sense in this respect, that it is written to the man that walks under the sun, which means a man that walks in a flesh body, telling you how to find peace of mind and how to control, if you would, your walk in this flesh body, telling you how to find happiness, also telling you what you're here for, and telling you what peace of mind is, teaching you those things that are not necessary one can discipline oneself to certainly walk peacefully and happy and boldly in our Heavenly Father. The book of Ecclesiastes meaning the preacher, the wisest of all, Solomon to you. Bless your hearts. We're back. Let's open up those 800 numbers. 1-800-643-4645 in this great state of Arkansas. 787-555-6. The Spirit moves on you. You have a question or comment, please feel free to share it. Okay, Claire from Pennsylvania. Prayer. I heard she heard her back. A new student. She wants to express how much she appreciates the high quality of your teaching and all the work of the crew there at the chapel. Thank you, Claire. Uh, it's, it's a work of love and joy. And Mary from Pennsylvania, prayer for an intestinal problem. The Father is able. And Eddie from Illinois, a prayer request. Would you pray for my brother-in-law? He had a heart attack a year ago, and now we find out he has cancer and has to have an operation. Wish you remember him. Okay, and from Clarence from West Virginia, a prayer request. Um... To, okay, uh, to uh, prayer for me, please. Okay, and then a question, and I'll take that question first. Okay, uh, Father, you hear the cries of the children. Throughout this hemisphere, beloved, now from Newfoundland to Brazil, let us join together in faith and say, Father, we know you're able. Touch, heal, in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Father. Oh, we love him so much. Okay, and Clarence also has a question. I wonder about that passage in the Bible that says, In the latter days, young men will prophesy and the old men will dream dreams. Would you explain? I'm quite an old and I'm quite old and have bad dreams quite often. Well, that's part of it too, uh, Clarence. Sometimes remember this, even when we eat sour pickles too late in the evening, we can have those bad dreams. So what the Father is speaking of there is that when and during this time of Antichrist, He's going to speak directly to us and through us, all right? We're not going to have to wonder or worry or be anxious. Our Father loves us. And when that time comes that you need that help, God's going to help you. He's going to give a word of wisdom from His Word, and when it is necessary, especially as this was an example of what happened in the book of Joel in the Minor Prophets on Pentecost Day. So it shall be when God's bride, adorned in the righteous wedding garment, is delivered up before... And now I'm going to deceive, I'm going to confuse someone. By that I mean their righteous acts of serving Jesus as they allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them, to denounce 
this Antichrist, we're not to premeditate what we will say. We don't know what we will say or be saying. But it, we do know the promises in Luke 21 that we will even convince the gainsayers. What a beautiful thing. So you hang in there. We haven't got long to go. Bob from Mississippi. When Peter asked Jesus how many times he should forgive his brother, seven times seven, Jesus replied, 70 times seven. This is related to the 70 times seven. Is this related to the 70 times seven in Daniel? Comment, um, the companion Bible is just what I've been looking for. God bless you all. Well, I'm glad you enjoy it, Bob. It is an excellent, wonderful study tool, and that's why we recommend it. No, I, the 70 times 7 might have been brought to mind in part because of that, but he really meant just that. We should forgive those that offend us. Just like I've been trying all day to forgive the building inspector that made us rip the wiring out of our new adjacent... Uh, <laughs> I wasn't supposed to say anything about that, but your old pastor has sure been dealing with forgiveness because we've been hassled. I'm not going to say any more about it now because we're in a position we could be hassled a whole bunch more. But this story will continue after, after, after. Be ready for it. And God help me to forgive also. So, um... We continue. I would say one thing to the business people of the world. Don't ever try to build a business building in Gravit, Arkansas. Stay away from it. Don't ever try to build anything here. You'll regret it if you do. I'll t there'll be more about that also. Just hang in there. Well, and God help me forgive. Oh, North Carolina, Francis. Will the Chinese people's government be with Russia against us. Yes, uh, Francis, it states that the, the men of the East shall join in. And of course, it is a communist nation. Communism is a bad, bad thing. And, uh, and as it becomes more prevalent in these end times, it fixes the nations. You know, yeah, I'll just make a little editorial on that, and I've got several questions and more coming in, but I, don't, I just want to say a word about this. You know, the beginning entrance concerning the Iran arms situation was truly to find moderates in Iran, because you see, Russia has a party already set in Tehran, and when the big push where there is a three pronged attack now that Kabbalah 5 at Basra is called off will be made. It is believed by the Russians that the most of the Iranian army will be wiped out and they will rush to Tehran. If our leftist congressmen were a little more interested in world conditions rather than their little political party, they would be aware of that. When Iran falls to Russia, then let's remember our little leftist political congressmen and their small minds and let the heroes rise. They cannot talk now. And maybe, as I've said before, I talk too much. But I felt it must be said. The party isn't over until the fat lady sings. So wise up, you that have ears to hear and eyes to see and know what's happening in this world. Okay, enough said. As communism marches on, so do our Congress that sit on the left side uh, of, uh, of politics. Uh, isn't it great that we live in a free country where we can express ourselves that way and make ourselves so well-loved and respected there as well? Wonderful America. Okay, Wilma Johnson. Wilma, okay, I won't mention the state because of Rick. Ezekiel 4411. The duties of the Levites, the 144,000, will slay the burnt offering and the sacrifices for the people in the millennium. How can there be burnt offerings in the millennium? Also, are the 7,000 sons of Zadok, the very chosen ones, is that, do they belong to the Levitical tribe? No, not necessarily. They were chosen in the world it was because of standing against Satan at that time. So it would not matter which 
tribe they come through, they were chosen as priest of God, the just in the world that was. It has nothing to do with tribes. Do you understand? The burnt offerings in the millennium, as I stated in teaching and completing that book of Ezekiel, all flesh is done away with. Therefore, you are correct. There can be no burnt offering. But God told us what he was talking about when he said, I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your love. So the sacrifice will be a sacrifice of love, a true offering of that that our Father wants in the millennium age. He wants your love, beloved, that comes after repentance. Kim from Wisconsin. Should the elect tell people about the coming in of Christ, and if we should tell our families and they believe, will they be able to stand against Antichrist? Kim, if they have ears to hear, they will stand. Otherwise, the seed is planted. Don't push it. Let it settle where it will, germinate if it will, but leave it then in God's hands. Never be afraid to plant a seed to the point that someone can't handle it. For uh, that doesn't mean dropping the anvil on them either when you're fishing. You know what I mean. But plant the seed gently, and if it grows, fine. If they are not grounded in the Word. No, the Father, it is impossible to be one of God's election and fall. All right? That was predetermined. You cannot believe in election. It is not to say that some of the elect will not have a great deal to be ashamed of and, uh, when that day comes. For we are all sinners, and there's none of us perfect. But those that have eyes to see and ears to hear can handle it. So you don't have to worry about that. Don't let it be a burden to you. And should we make it a point to tell people about the coming in of Christ, or should we just wait Till the Spirit moves. I think until the Spirit moves. What do I mean by that, though? Let me qualify it. it might cause someone to ask you, well, what, what really do you believe? You might plant a mild seed. That's the Spirit moving through that person seeking. If he asks and you don't answer, then you're accountable, you see. Okay, uh, Julian, Julian from Kansas. What is blaspheming? What is blaspheming the Holy Spirit? I really love your ministry. Well, thank you, uh, and we enjoy and love you for being with us. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to be stand delivered up before the synagogue of Satan. And when the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, as it is written in Mark 13, wishes to speak through you, if you choose Satan instead, that's the highest of blasphemy and you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It's unforgivable. In this world are the one to come. God's elect, I do not believe, are capable of that, and it was for this love of Jesus Christ that he shortened the, the days, else even the elect would be deceived. Fran from New Jersey, chapter 47, 12 in Ezekiel, what is the word months? What, what, is it, what does this word indicate? I love you all. We love you too, Fran. Um, it indicates exactly that, Christ's seasons. I think it says His seasons, His months. But I, I, want, you to, I want you to make a note of Revelation chapter 22, what is it, verse 2, I believe it is, 1 or 2, where that tree of life, which is Yeshua Messiah, and then you understand why it's His seasons, because He is that tree that produces that food. Revelation 22, verse 2 will help clarify that for you, okay? Margie from Louisiana, please go back over Ezekiel 44, 22. Shall not take wives uh, or of, of a widow except a widow of a priest, not clear in her mind. Beloved, listen to me closely. We are preparing a bride for that wedding at the end of the millennium, all right? Don't take anyone that is not worthy even for that second wedding when the second, it is called the second death in Revelation 20. It does not mean we will be giving and taking in marriage because we're not able. We will be as the angels. Ken from Ohio. Do you think the uh, collapse of the money system is the wounding of the first beast in Revelation 13? 
um, the Argentina loan default, etc. Keep up the good work. It, no doubt, in as much as there are four hidden dynasties, the economy, the political, the religious, and the educational, it will be a part in that. It will not totally collapse because it will be propped back up. Antichrist comes prosperously and peacefully. Buck from uh, Maryland. First John, God is light, and in his, him is no darkness. Thou shalt not kill. Isn't it true that, and it also states we should love our neighbor, we should love our enemies, as in 2 Timothy. Um, not to, we shouldn't engage ourselves in the affairs of this life. Don't you think that Christian soldiers should be getting out of the military to keep from being sent to the, do you reckon somebody's trying to make me angry to see my Irish boil? I think so. Buck, you wouldn't do that, would you? You wouldn't do that to this old ex-Marine sergeant, would you? If they should, rather than being sent to places like Nicaragua, there where they would kill, which is, if I really thought you were serious, you would get due reward. In the first place, you show ignorance as a Bible scholar. It does not say thou shalt not kill. It says you shall not commit murder. It says a murderer is in danger of judgment. You lie in wait to kill someone, you do. God does not respect anyone that will not protect his own family. I have shed blood for this nation before. I would do it again against communism. I dislike these second-class Christians that feel that dis un they do not understand God's Word. If, if you wanted it, you're going to get it, Buck, all right? Love your enemy. He told you to love your children, but to whop them if they get out of line. You do the same thing with your enemy, even if it takes a 30-30. You whop him if he's got a 30-30. God expects Christians to stand up and be men and women of God that protect themselves and do not allow people to run over them. Do I agree with your theory? I think you've got the answer. May from Kentucky. Will we in heaven have flesh bodies? Will we in heaven in flesh bodies see Antichrist? Well, you're, I'm sorry. I see now it says in human flesh bodies will we see Antichrist in a flesh body or will we see him as an image in supernatural body only? Beloved, the supernatural body, body looks as a flesh body. When our, when our brothers wandered in the wilderness, what did they eat? They ate manna. What is manna? Manna is the food of angels, the book of Psalms, documentation. Therefore, the same food that sustained the angelic body sustains the flesh body. You would be, you would be hard pressed to tell the difference. However, he is not human. He is supernatural. But he looks. Do you know what supernatural means? It means more natural. Very natural. He will look very natural as he plays instead of Jesus. He will deceive many. We will see him. We will see his image only in as much as an image, not, not a shadow or a ghost, but on television. Ben from Alabama pray for a healing for my arm. I had uh, an operation a year ago and I need prayer. Explain how sin entered into the creation of the sixth day, the ethnos. I really appreciate this teaching. I've been, I've been teaching my daughter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. That's what Ben is saying here. Yahweh. Thank you, Ben. We'll pray for it and it's wonderful that you um, are teaching your daughter. Satan, as it is written, was among the creatures of the field, which means he was also among the people of the field, the world. And anytime Satan's there, sin has a way of finding its own self. Father, this is long enough, Father, one year. As our faith joins together, touch and heal in Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Um, Oliver from Alabama, we enjoy your special it was great. It cleared up so much. Well, thank you, Oliver. I'm glad you did, and praise God. I enjoy taking a little time between 
books, and I may do one or two more specials this coming week in some of the older masters that are just gone to update them a little bit. Steve from Texas, do you agree with Reagan, I'm sorry, with uh, Ryan and Cap on his, Raymond Cap, I'm sorry, on his work of the pyramids. I appreciate your teaching. I'm a babe in Christ, but you're helping me a lot. Well, God bless you, Steve. I appreciate that. E. Raymond Cap is a very good friend of mine, a close friend, I might say. And he has been in this chapel many times. And we're going to have him again here in person to teach you all. I've been promising that, but it's going to happen. Yes, I agree with much of his teaching. And um, uh, he is an archaeologist. I am a Bible scholar. And it makes a good combination for the two to uh, bump heads every once in a while. But we have a great agreement and uh, share a great deal and a great love for each other. So, yes, I agree with... He's, he's a wonderful servant of Almighty God, and I'm going to look forward to the time that he can get away and be here with us. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, I think the pyramid is God's Bible in stone, the same as the stars are His Word in heaven. How precious it is. Well, beloved, I see that we're, I see that we're out of time, and... Um, it seems like this hour goes so much. I don't know. When we get our new studio and we get these lights up out of my face, we may do a little more live timing, and I'm praying about it. All of you pray that I can get forgiveness. Won't you do it? You help me in that. Woo! This Irishman doesn't like to be hassled, but uh, I need your help in prayer for that. Now, I want to continue this story, but you wait till we get our, you wait till we get things the way we want them before we do, and then I'll let the whole story right out of the bag. Well, I love y'all. You be good to each other. And stay in His Word. We're brought to you by your tithes and your offerings. How we, how we love spending this time with you. We fe actually feel your presence. Stay in His Word. That's what makes our presence, wherever we are, in one. Stay in His Word, for Jesus Christ is that one. He is the living Word. Thank you for joining with us in today's study of God's Word. If you would like to hear today's message again on audio cassette, or if you would like to know some of the other deeper in-depth studies that Pastor Murray has covered, write for the free tape catalog. Write Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. That's Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 727 36. And don't forget to mention Tape Catalog. Shepherd's Chapel also has a monthly newsletter letting you know what's happening at the chapel. So if you would like to receive this monthly newsletter, write to Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Thank you for joining us. And join us again each Monday through Friday at this same time for Shepherd's Chapel.